Hello, everybody, and I'm happy to be here as um, host uh, on behalf of um, the Center for Russian Studies of the University of Bucharest, Romania. My name is Mihail Zvan Unguranu. I'm a professor at the University of Bucharest, the Faculty of History, and I'm happy to announce everybody who has paid interest into our meeting that uh, this podcast um, uh, uh, is organized by the Center um, in the framework of the project called Interdisciplinary Research on Russia's Geopolitics in the Black Sea and the Arctic Ocean, financed by the financial mechanism of um, the European Union addressing Southeastern Europe. Um, our main partner is uh, Norway, the, and namely the um, uh, Fridjof Nansen Institute in Oslo, one, and I salute through Professor Mo, uh, our colleagues from there, happy to have him here. Um, sometime, sometime next uh, week, uh, our colleague, um, uh, Dr. Ivor Neumann will join this podcast, but with a um, pre-recorded um, pre speech. Now the uh, speakers, just a couple of words about every one of us. Um, Dr. Erhard Buzek will be the first. Um, he's now the chairman of the Institute of the Danube Region and Central Europe in, in, in Vienna, Institute for the Donau and Middle Europa. He's a, a former minister for science and research, a minister, former minister of education, and um, a former vice chancellor of the Republic of Austria. Um, he's been the special representative of the Austrian government for the enlargement of the European Union. He's one of the most important authors of the enlargement of the European Union with Austria uh, in the 90s. He's been special coordinator of the Stability Pact for Southeastern Europe, president of the Vienna uh, Economic Forum, and um, Jean Monnet professor at, at Persona. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Radu Karp will join later. I will introduce him at the time. Professor uh, Diaconescu from, um, uh, from the University of Bucharest is a historian. He's deputy dean of the Faculty of History in the University of Bucharest and project manager of the Romanian Center for Russian, for Russian Studies. He's a very distinguished specialist. He, well, he was a former medievalist. Now he's, a, uh, he's working on, on, on modern history. And he's one of the most interested and, and devoted uh, specialists in the questions related to Transnistria and to minorities in, in Transnistria and on the uh, northern coast of the, Black, of the Black Sea. He's also uh, interested in the political situation in the Donbas, and he will discuss more about this with us. Um, Professor Goshu is our colleague from um, the um, uh, Faculty of Political Sciences in the University of Bucharest. He's Associate Professor of Russian Politics, Political and Diplomatic History of the Russian Empire. He is the Romanian expert on, on Russia. And I'm very happy to have him here uh, as well. Uh, Professor uh, Armin Heinen from Aachen um, is specialized from the University of Aachen, is specialized in modern and contemporary history. And his academic interests were among other Others, the history of European integration, the history of violence, the cultural history of Europe, and uh, uh, last but not least, I must say, he's one of the most brilliant connoisseurs of the Romanian of Romanian history, and the PhD um, uh, honoris causa of the universities in Galatia and, and and Timisoara. Glad to see you again, Armin here. Uh, Professor Kemper from Amsterdam has the chair of uh, Eastern European Studies at the Department of History, European Studies and Religious Studies of the Faculty of Humanities at the Amsterdam University. And he is one of the most distinguished PhD holders in Islamic and Oriental Studies, impressive CV, impressive CV. Uh, Mr. Ariel Mo, uh, Professor Ariel Mo is a research professor at the Fridjof Nansen Institute uh, in Norway. And his research is mainly devoted to Russia its energy sector and politics. Currently, he's engaged in a project on consequences of climate change for the economic development in Russia's Arctic. 
and I think that your presence, Arild, is most welcome from this point of view. I mean, it adds to the weight of expertise in Russian studies. Uh, Sebastian, Dr. Sebastian Schaeffer is the managing director of the Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe, Institute for the Donau and Mittel Europa. He has a master in European studies in legal studies and history at the University of Regensburg, one in political science, European law and Slavonic studies at the Ludwig Maximilian Universität in Munich. Was I, was I precise enough, I hope? Okay, brilliant. Now, um, Dr. Buzek, I would like to... Um, uh, have you uh, making the first step into our discussion. So what means recent parliamentary elections in Russia? I think the recent uh, parliamentary election in Russia is a continuation of a development to which we are looking uh, since a lot of years. Uh, that the chances for a scene in Russia is going down. Uh, I think it's coming back to a system which might be between uh, the Stalinist time without Stalin uh, and uh, the Tsarist uh, time. I think uh, it is a total uh, government without uh, less chances uh, for contribution of the citizens and so on and so on. I think nobody expected anything else, I think. <clears throat> but we have to look back and we had a time where we had more hopes <laughs> looking to Russia <clears throat> that it might improve. Uh, I think here we have to look at this, that step by step the chances are going really down. I think it was a time where somebody was thinking might be that other parties are coming up in Russia and so on and so on. Uh, then it was the idea, uh, okay, uh, Putin is staying uh, for two periods and then he will go. No, then he was clever enough to put in, uh, in between Medvedev and then come again. Now he's uh, for a lifetime and uh, I think uh, I'm not expecting wonders, uh, but I think uh, the only uh, way where his term can be ended is if his life is ended. Uh, uh, not by a brutal way, but uh, I think uh, that's uh, the only hope we can have in this direction. Uh, I think that should be said quite clear. Also, the second point which I had to add, seen from a Western point of view and a Central European one, I think uh, hopes that some groups are appearing and uh, getting chances in Russia are also going down. We have this sad story about Navalny, but it is not the first story. Uh, it's a long, ongoing story, which is existing without no chances. And here I'm a little bit critical on those who are naming themselves democracies in Europe and outside. I think the results of pressure or the results of strategies, I think to change the situation uh, to influence in Russia and so on and so on is not really existing. Uh, I think this is a thing which, uh, beside a lot of other questions, the European Union has to look. Uh, here I may say in this context, it is wrong to say the European Union. I have to say the member states of the European Union, because uh, the different member states of the European Union have also a different approach uh, to Russia. Uh, I think uh, some friendly notes are also existing and so on and so on. And the second point is, and it is extremely important, uh, that the European Union is not Europe. And the influence uh, of Russia on different uh, areas uh, within Europe is a big one and is a growing one. We have these open, open, open problems uh, which are hurting very much, like Donetsk, uh, the Ukraine, Crimea, and so on and so on. We have... Uh, less chances, I think, to improve the situation in Belarus. Uh, we have the influence of the Russians uh, on the Balkans. Uh, I think uh, Serbia, okay, Serbia is in favor of the European Union. Serbia is in favor uh, sometimes of Turkey. Serbia is in favor of the Russians. Serbia is in, and so on and so on. I think we have no clear positions for sure existing. Uh, I think the introduction of my friend Mihai was in the direction of Black Sea. 
the Brexit area is really dominated by the Russians, maybe a little bit by the Turks. I was part of a working group uh, which was led by the German uh, chairmanship in the European Union, uh, I think, to improve the situation in, uh, uh, the, along the Black Sea. I think it was very interesting uh, because we, we got two remarks on this, uh, which the same content, but from different direction. The first remark was in Turkey. Uh, Black Sea is not the area for the European Union, get out. Uh, and the second word of the direction was Russia. Uh, Black Sea, go out, it's not your field. Uh, insofar, this situation uh, is true also today, will be an interesting question because the situation in Turkey are also sometimes maybe volatile uh, or, the, or under other auspices uh, and so on and so on. Uh, that's a view, I think, uh, let me say, more European. What is interesting is uh, that we are trained after the changes, downfall for the Iron Curtain and so on and so on, I think to speak about uh, uh, not any more about super forces and so on and so on, but uh, that United States is important. It was always said Russia is important. Now this, everybody is convinced that uh, China is important and so on and so on. I have the feeling that the importance of Russia in this context is a little bit going down because the economic situation uh, is not uh, so fit uh, for the Russians. I think the power is in a certain way going down and we have to have a view uh, in which directions might move. I think Russia is still big, the biggest country uh, of the world. They have a lot of sources and so on and so on. But uh, along the discussions about the energy, for example, uh, the second Nord Stream pipeline and so on and so on, uh, you get some sec second noises, uh, what is really happening, but does it really work? Because the changes in energy concerning the climate uh, situation has also an impact on, on uh, uh, Russia uh, in this direction. Uh, in which direction will it move? What is going on here? We have still a strong influence of Russia at the Balkans, uh, but the Chinese are here coming up and are even partly stronger and more present than the Russians. I think uh, here we should have a look at this, what the real situation is. And then for sure is a global context, and it's quite clear uh, that for a longer time, the United States have, have changed the critical partnership to Russia uh, to the critical partnership to China. Uh, that's also a very important situation uh, to which we have to look. I think uh, it's one sentence which is always said nowadays, everything is moving. We don't know exactly in which directions, uh, but that has an impact also on this situation and depends uh, what Putin will do. And is he able, I think, to handle it? I think what we have to look really is who will come after Putin. I think uh, by the age of uh, Vladimir Putin, I think it plays a very important role. And I think the power is not anymore the same. I think he is still tremendous powerful. And uh, I would wish that the European Union is able to develop such a power and such a possibilities, what is not really existing. But this we have also discussed under the perspective of future. First statement, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Erhard. Thank you very much, Dr. Buzek, for your, uh, for your excellent introduction into this enormous topic about what Russia will be on. This is why now contemporaries of modern Europe um, realize that uh, we should have um, possibility, the possibility of accessing uh, something like a pithyatic oracle to know exactly, or at least to have an idea about what will happen in the future. Well, since we have gone through the désenchantement du monde, uh, that's impossible to have it now. Thank you very much for your uh, for your intervention, dear Erhard. Dr. Buzek, uh, thank you for um, introducing us to, to the topic. I will turn now to Dan Perry, 
who uh, has been a long time Associated Press foreign correspondent um, in Eastern Europe and um, uh, near Orient, uh, the Near Eastern countries. He has now a position, he switched to a position of managing partner to a New York communications firm. And he is one of the most distinguished authors um, a lot of newspapers and um, publications in general, serious publications in the world, um, would be happy to have him aboard. His last uh, piece came out in uh, Newsweek, if I'm not mistaken, just two days ago, and I'll be happy to share the, the link um, with you. It's about the illnesses of modern democracies. Then, uh, <laughs> apart from the fact that we share a long time and standing friendship and that we have signed together some pieces as well. Can you hear me? Yes, Mihai, good to, good to be here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear quite well. I have three questions for you and I'd be happy to hear your opinion about this. Well, the first will go just like this. What would be, this is an unexpected question. What would be your view of the elections that were just held? Yeah, well, yes, I mean, well, that's the general topic. That's the general topic. No, I mean, I'm happy. <laughs> Look, I think the word election needs to be put in quotes in this context. There should be few, few illusions about Russia being a democracy. And I think the reasons why Russia is not a democracy are bit repeating because we're living in an era of some confusion. So just to be totally clear, most obviously, Credible reports that counts are rigged and falsified. But beyond that, on the systemic level, Putin has dismantled and marginalized the most credible opposition parties. Two, the media is almost totally controlled or uh, by or directly owned by the government. And, and almost all you see is propaganda glorifying Putin and his cronies. Um, three, social media is manipulated by, by methods we, we saw them use in the U.S. and elsewhere, but also by direct coercion to remove critical content. Uh, for the Kremlin essentially controls the courts and uses them to, pu to punish uh, wealthy Russians that don't toe the line, like Mikhail Khodorkovsky in the 2000s, or politicians who discomfort Putin, like Navalny and many others today. And most people inside Russia and outside Russia, I think, understand the courts are a tool for the government and not much more. And then, of course, you have the direct intimidation campaign as most effective rival, the aforementioned Navalny's in jail, on nonsense charges, and the previous um, uh, a person holding that mantle, Boris Nemtsov, was assassinated in 2015, not far from the Kremlin. Indeed, there have been innumerable poisonings and bizarre killings of politicians and journalists and oligarchs and turncoat spies, whose common factor in all cases was displeasing, displeasing the Kremlin. So, look, uh, yeah, of course, I have to add, as the previous speaker noted the history of putin getting around term limits by switching roles between being president and prime minister and then back again in each case making his new position the more powerful and recently changing the constitution to allow him to be president until 2036 so essentially for life as as he said the bottom line under these circumstances one cannot speak of an election in russia uh any more than one could speak of elections in syria it's simply a fake democracy. Okay, thank you. It's like adding nonsense to our meeting. Now, <laughs> a, a, a second, a second question I I I I cooked for you. Um, how would you think? What would you think about the reconfirmation of Putin as leader? Is this likely to impact Russia's relations with Europe and the rest of the world? Well, since it is fake, uh, the so-called results were never in doubt, and therefore there's no immediate direct impact in a way that. You could speak of uh, with the Trump or Biden elections, they had an impact because there was a doubt. There, there was not a doubt that Putin's United Russia would be declared the winner. So, so one cannot react to, you know, quote unquote result. But what can be said is this. I think it is significant. It is significant. And again, I'm a little bit repeating what the previous speaker said. It's significant that Putin has brazenly done it again and is getting away with it. And as far as I can tell, we're not going to have a repeat of the protests that did scare the regime a little in 2011. It basically means that for the time being, uh, there is enough oil and gas money and enough repression and enough disinformation for the scam to continue to work. And so it will be business as usual for Putin. What does that mean? Well, it means Russia will continue on its path, uh, doing some aggressive things that are reasonable for a country that wants to be a world power, actually, and also some things that are outrageous 
in the latter category, uh, Russia will certainly continue to seek to undermine democracy in the West through digital disinformation campaigns. In the former, you know, more reasonable category, Russia will certainly continue to oppose NATO wherever it can. Um, unlike the 2000s notion of cooperation, which was canceled about a decade ago, and it will always look for ways to weaken a Western alliance. Um, in general, it'll continue to look for ways to maximize influence, whether in the Eastern Mediterranean, where it has project, where it tries to project power through naval bases in Syria and elsewhere, certainly all over the former Soviet Union, the Baltics, for sure an issue, uh, and really wherever they can find influence in Asia and Europe and Turkey, and if at all possible, India, and maybe even though it's a long shot, China, um, they will certainly continue to unapologetically support dictators from, from Assad of Syria to Lukashenko of Belarus on down, uh, and they'll pursue an independent strategy on Iran. I have to say uh, that the main thing in a way politically it doesn't seem as if they will shirk from doing the one thing that probably most upsets the West, uh, which is not even the political rep repression at home or even uh, aggressive military, you know, actions uh, abroad, um, but rather the killing and poisoning of political opponents in sometimes farcical fashion on Western territory, which is really a poking in the eye of countries like Britain. Um, and the last thing I'll mention, actually, is it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the EU, uh, which until now has been a little bit sanguine to the fact that it's 27 countries. And again, um, as has been said, are they countries or is it a bloc? Uh, you know, as a bloc, they depend on Russia for only almost 40 percent of their natural gas, which means heating in the winter. And Germany, and this is very critical this month and in coming weeks, may be the, the pivot point. Uh, ahead of the coming elections to replace Angela Merkel in particular, because even though that is a country that in other areas actually tries to act these days on principle, they've been willing very much to look the other way, but they have the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which is about to be completed, which will transport Russian natural gas directly to Germany, and which has many people in Europe and, and, and lately also in Germany worried, because especially if the SPD, the center-left SPD, wins the election, um, we may see the beginnings of a pushback on Putin. You know, some German politicians are actually calling for the pipeline to be revisited, but I fear it may be too late for that. Okay, then what you say is that in a way Putin is predictable. I mean, that he hasn't changed too much of his lines of conduct. Is there a broader lesson that should be learned from here? I think there actually is um, in a way that relates to how we want to conduct our civilization in actually democratic country, uh, countries. I mean, I think for sure at present, the world, it's clear, will not do much to help the Russian people. And we're living in an era of, you know, real politic. Um, we see this in the four years of Trump, where the United States was unusually open in its position that it will follow its own economic and geostrategic interests without any regard for humanitarian, moral, or other issues. But we also, I must say, we see it today when you have a far more moderate and, you know, dialectical government in Washington. Um, because, you know, Biden, theoretically more modern and thoughtful and dialectical and less transactionalist, he just abandoned Afghanistan with shocking speed. And then organize a new alliance with the UK and Australia without any regard to the outrage that's caused in France and to the damage to France. And even the fact that Biden himself opposed Brexit, but in so doing, he's helping Boris Johnson. The world is clearly not going to step in to help the Russian people directly. And the world is not even willing to pay much of a price in terms of lost business. You know, George Soros is rather alone in calling on the US and its businesses. I'm sorry? No, no, go on, go on, go on. No, to, to, I mean, I'm saying George Soros, you know, he, he just wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal. It was very interesting. And he's calling on the U.S. to shun China and to not be transactionalist. But look at what's happening. You know, Google and Apple were complied in, in a very meek fashion when the Kremlin told them about a week ago to remove their from their app stores uh, an application run by Navalny's opposition group, which would have helped organize some strategic voting in, in the so-called election. We're living in a time when money talks. There is a chance, I think, uh, that Putin will overreach if I try to be a little bit less bleak in a, in a sense, 
You know, I mean, after the annexation of Crimea, his overt support for the cartoonish and brutal dictatorship in Belarus, the poisoning and jailing of Navalny involving underwear and complete ridiculousness. There, there may come a point where the, acqui- where the acquiescence is tested, uh, but that point is not yet upon us. And as long as Putin survives and keeps getting away with this, it will not only embolden, in my view, uh, other fake democracies in places like Hungary and Poland and Turkey and Venezuela and whatever, but also threat to seep into truly democratic countries. And I say that because, and I guess this is my main point here, there is so much skepticism around the world about democracy these days. And the reasons are many. Uh, and I personally related to the tremendous inequality caused by the tech revolution combined with globalization and also disruptive migration patterns, which sort of fly in the face of a human tendency towards tribalism and national and national identity, all of which led to a disconnect between city and country and educated people versus all the rest, basically. And there's tons of people that don't really believe in the principles of, of democracy. And when I say democracy, I actually mean liberal democracy with, with its protection of minorities and checks and balances where a majority can't decide to kill the minority. You know? People on the populist right are moving away from this uh, because they hate minorities. And there's also an anti-democratic um, stream on the extreme left, in particular in America. People on the populist left are moving away uh, because they see established institutions as racist and they care more about equality of outcome than meritocracy. And liberals in the middle, basically like me, and I have to say, I think me high like you, are 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 moving away from both because they're horrified by the results of 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 too many actually democratic elections so you know what i say here attaches and i think you hear by my accent how i care about why i would care about this it attaches first and foremost to the united states where elements of both the left and the right but in particular the republican party you know they look like people who have given a chance would um, would act not very differently from United Russia and from Putin, which is, of course, a tragedy from the U.S. And for as long as the U.S. remains the world's diminishing but still indispensable country, it's a tragedy for the world. Okay, Dan, thank you so much. Uh, but stay stay with us. Yeah, am I allowed to interfere? Yes, absolutely. Uh, to ask absolutely, because please. afterwards I have to leave. Please. Uh, in the context of the last statement. I want to raise a very brutal question. Do you consider that the Russians might decide to use uh, military power, I think, uh, to, to catch the countries uh, where the Soviet Union was former at, uh, uh, here, like uh, Lithuania, uh, Estonia, Latvia? Uh, do you think that they might interfere in uh, Ukraine, uh, I think, to solve this problem on the footprints? Uh, would they integrate Belarusia? Uh, because I think uh, to be still powerful as they have been in the time of Soviet Union is a temptation. Uh, is it possible? Because this weakness of democracy, where you are totally right, uh, I have a, uh, it touches me very much because as a generation grown up after the Second World War, it is horrible what's happening here. Uh, would the democracy democracies we decided to fight against or will they submit i i mean that's a great question and you know uh, russia is so of course it's really kgb fsb rule but but it's not just putin it's it's his own but it's sufficiently centralized where it's impossible to prophesy and you never know you can't really predict what one person or one cabal or a cabal of a tight-knit cabal of people will do. My sense, though, is that they're very clever, that they're too clever to risk the kind of uh, the, the disastrous potential results of the thing that you're talking about. I don't think they're going to invade anything. I think they will continue to push the envelope in ways that are subtle and, um, and, and able to be uh, manipulated through disinformation like they did in Donetsk, like they did in Crimea, Crimea. I mean, it, it was on the cusp of provoking a global reaction, but just short of it, you know? So I would not be surprised by manipulations in the Baltics to install acquiescent governments 
I would not be surprised by some further annexationist thing that might happen in Ukraine. I wouldn't be surprised by the sudden emergence of an agreement uh, with Lukashenko in in um, uh, Belarus to essentially turn Russia and Belarus into one country. I think part of Putin's appeal, such a, as it exists, uh, genuine appeal within Russia, is that he's restoring the glories of the empire. And I suspect they will continue to do this in every way that they can, short of triggering a NATO reaction or an actual war. And it'll be, it's, you know, it'll be a real test of how much the West cares about this zone of the former Soviet Union. My suspicion is they do not care because the focus right now from the United States is on China and the perspective of Europe is very much real politic. They just care about the European Union and solidifying its own economic stability. Thank you very much, Dan, and thank you for joining us in. I know that you are quite busy at this time of the day, and I, I, I appreciate your presence very much, and thank you for taking the time again. And uh, I look forward to seeing you, um, uh, to, to, to have you as guests in our next, uh, in our next meetings online or in personam. Thank you My so pleasure, much. Mihai. Thank you for inviting me. I really do have to go, but it really has been a pleasure. I enjoyed the back and forth. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I, will now, I will now turn to um, uh, Professor Goshu, our, my distinguished guest from um, the um, Faculty of Political Studies, University of Bucharest. Armand? Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Mihai. Uh, I invite you to focus uh, on um, uh, Russia's uh, Russia domestic policy um, and to talk a bit about uh, uh, the most uh, important topic during the Russian election campaign, uh, smart voting, Umne Galasavani. Uh, I think it's important to talk uh, about it. It's something very different uh, for our countries. And uh, I stress that against smart voting, the Kremlin has launched a campaign to discredit and combat it uh, using the entire machinery of the state from uh, Peskov, Dmitry Peskov, uh, the Kremlin uh, spokesman to Maria Zakharova, uh, Russia's flamboyant diplomatic uh, spokeswoman, uh, to anonymous uh, members of uh, regional uh, parliaments, they have all commented very, very critically on smart voting um, as uh, when it, smart voting is uh, the most important political opponent for Putin. Um, even uh, Analysts said that uh, by, poison by poisoning Navalny a year ago, the power hoped to block smart voting in to run up uh, to September's parliamentary elections. Navalny's survival and return to Russia led to the Kremlin changing its tactics towards the opposition, declaring anti-corruption foundation um, foreign agent and uh, extremist organization. Uh, as uh, you know, leaders of the Anti-Corruption Foundation can be put 10 years in prison and the ordinary, ordinary members uh, from two to six years. But what is the smart voting? How can electoral tactic be uh, Putin's most important opponent? Smart voting, Omne Galasavani, it's a voting strategy whose goal is to consolidate the votes uh, for those who oppose United Russia, Edina Russia, Putin's party, which has dominated um, the Russian political scene for the last 20 years. Small voting was proposed by Navalny uh, three years ago. Uh, for local, regional, and parliamentary elections. And um, since Russia uh, political parties are unable uh, um, to unite and nominate a single candidate against Edina Russia, 
voters uh, can take decision themselves. In the September uh, 2019 local uh, election in Moscow, uh, smart voting uh, has proven effective and increasing the chances of opposition candidates. Some researchers, very uh, interesting data, talk about five to seven percent um, for opposition candidates uh, because of smart voting. Um, in Moscow, in Tomsk, Novosibirsk, uh, Tambov, um, opposition candidates. Uh, backed by smart voting, uh, perform very well. In uh, Khabarovsk, uh, the election for the local parliament and the election for the governor were won by smart voting candidate. As you know, uh, the government of Khabarovsk region, Sergei Furgal was arrested a year ago, uh, since last summer. He has been imprisoned in uh, Moscow, in Lefortovo, uh, but uh, this proves that uh, smart voting uh, uh, works. The good tactics to defeat uh, Edina Rasia. Um, in uh, at the beginning of September, few uh, days ago, two journalists uh, from uh, Rostov. Rastic for uh, reposting news about Omega Savani on social media. Um, and of the hundreds of candidates backed by smart voting tactics, a few thousand managed to defeat the Russian, uh, uh, the United Russia candidates. That reason enough for Kremlin to fight uh, against smart voting. Um, all the eyes in this election were on Moscow where the candidates backed by Um Galasavani as to the chance against the candidacy in power and the fact that electronic voting in Moscow uh, differed greatly from regular voting and uh, the more than two hours uh, delay in publishing the results on, of the electronic vote reinforced suspicion of fraud in the parliamentarian election. And um, it reinforced the idea that, uh, at least in Moscow, uh, constituencies, smart voting worked and opposition candidates backed by smart voting won the election over the ruling candidates. Only the power um, stole the position victory with electronic uh, uh, voters. Um, um, even Navan in the message about the um, election, so-called election, uh, on the Telegram channel uh, says that uh, it was the greatest uh, success of smart voting, but the smart voting victory was uh, stolen. The biggest problem, however, um, was ignored by Navan and the leaders of uh, smart voting um, Techniques Volkov, Zdanov, and Penchik. And this is the fact that the most of uh, uh, 1,000 smart voting recommendations are in support of communist candidates. And uh, the communist leader, Gennady Zyuganov, has said on numerous occasions and repeated yesterday on uh, Yeho Moskva radio that he belongs to the same political camp as Putin, the national patriotic camp fighting the uh, cosmopolitan liberals of which uh, Navalny is a member. Uh, single smart uh, voting is proving to be a civic and political phenomenon whose consequences can be limited by power. To be successful, the political opposition in, Ru in uh, Russia needs much more than smart voting. Uh, one chance would be for a representative of the democratic camp to win the leadership in the Communist Party. The Communist Party is split in two camp and transform the Communist Party from a system 
party uh, loyal to Putin into the uh, real uh, opposition uh, party. Thank you for... Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Gorshu. Thank you, Armand, for this very interesting uh, insight into the um, meaning of um, opposition in, in, in Russia and its paradoxical um, composition of different camps um, in such a way that the classical definitions of ideology would not function anymore. I will turn now to, to uh, Dr. Schaeffer and ask him for um, two things. First, about his opinions um, concerning the uh, parliamentary, uh, parliamentary elections and Russia. And second, what would be the influence these parliamentary elections could pay onto South East European countries, um, members or non-members of the European Union, and uh, least but not last, Germany. Sebastian. And, and yeah, your comment. You. And your comments, and your comments, please. <laughs> to, what's been said, to what's been said until now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mihai. Yeah, I, I, I will try to be uh, brief, um, but I will focus on all, all these um, things that you mentioned. I would categorize it into three different points. What does it mean? Um, what does the elections mean uh, for Russia? What do the elections mean for the EU and the uh, shared neighborhood? And then uh, also what, what do they mean um, for Germany or the perception that we that we have um, about this. I would, if, if I would have to give it a title, um, I would blatantly steal from uh, Masha Gessen and uh, say the future is history. We have many uh, distinguished historians among us here. It's unfortunate, not in the sense that we need to be aware of the history in order to shape our future, but it's rather that the the, the future for democracy and also the future, I have to say, um, and, and, and it, 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 it makes me very, very sad to say this actually, also the future of EU-Russia relations are um, more or less history. Why? We've heard already um, that we shouldn't actually be talking about elections. They have not been free and fair, but this is not something that is surprising. Uh, this is not something that we haven't known already. We know um, that that this time there there has been a uh, a um, sort of uh, scaling up in the uh, initiatives to to uh, falsify and rig um, the outcomes in order to fulfill the picture that we want to have uh, that that the Kremlin wants to have. Um, but I could tell you a story where I uh, actually participated in uh, an election um, for the Moscow State Duma 10 years back when I visited a friend and he asked me, do you want to vote? Because this uh, was how much um, um, democracy-oriented, uh, progressive, Western, uh, traveling, understanding Russians already viewed the importance of elections because they thought that they are irrelevant uh, already back then. So um, second point, the relationship between uh, Russia and the EU. Again, here we have learned not uh, a great deal um, over the past few decades in, these, um, in, in, in how to deal with um, the Russian Federation. Uh, we have seen this mockery that uh, Lavrov, who is a who is a brilliant diplomat, uh, kudos to him, um, but he is in office since what 2004, and we have not managed to anticipate and understand how he functions. I've seen him back at, at the NATO summit uh, in his very early days, how he behaved behind closed doors and how he behaved. Uh, in front of the press. Now, okay, we might be used um, in, in, uh, within the EU that behind closed doors, you are normally more open and uh, more, more, more critical. And then towards the press, you behave more diplomatic and, and try to uh, sugarcoat the words. He is the exact opposite. And he plays this and he does this and we do not understand this. And uh, 
it baffles me that a, a uh, one of the highest representatives of the European Union um, is 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 openly um, humiliated and then puts out a press release and tells us um, it's now up to the member states to decide. That's a literal quote. Um, and in in that case, we have learned nothing. Um, these hopes in in uh, a, a democratic development in the Russian Federation um, uh, are are perpetuated and and embodied in in personalities that will never ever fulfill this. It was the case with Medvedev, where there was some sort of discussion that there will be this. Uh, this uh, maybe democratic change because they adhere at least to the constitution. Um, there, there is this focusing now on Navalny um, where I don't understand that uh, how, how this can be projected into him being the savior of Russian democracy, which he will most likely not be. Um, you are projecting, it's a, it's a, reality distortion that that is projected when um, we deal with EU-Russia uh, relations. Don't get me wrong, I don't mean you in general, I mean the overall discourse. I know that there are people aware of this. I know that people are, are, are focusing on this and writing this, but the general discourse um, is, is completely uh, distorted. And then when uh, we um, come to the to the uh, to the region. We'll see that uh, what has been mentioned that there. I mean this 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 whole um, Putin model becomes a a a sort of blueprint for certain developments in the shared neighborhood. Some are are following it. Some are trying to um, to fight it. But uh, if we do not find a, 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 a manageable way to deal with this, we are going to lose also, um, or if we stick with this, the, the future of European EU, but also in the shared neighborhood, democracy uh, will also be, uh, I'm afraid, uh, history very, very soon. Um, there is... Uh, um, a, a, a sort of uh, comment that has been raised that uh, Germany might change a little bit, and this is the third point, uh, its position after the election towards Russia, which I am uh, not so certain about uh, when, when, it comes to, um, when it comes to either of the two currently um, more or less in, in the polls uh, front runners from the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats. Um, we have a uh, election to the Bundestag, but there is also an election in uh, the northeastern uh, Bundesland, Schleswig-Holstein, and uh, this is where the Nord Stream pipeline ends. And uh, the um, no, Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, um, sorry, other is Northwest. Um, it's a shame I worked there uh, <laughs> in former days. Anyways, this election is going to happen. Uh, the, the, the prime minister is from the SPD, uh, very much in favor uh, of it. Um, the thing is built. They want it. The only obstacle that is there is uh, now getting the legal, um, the legal uh, uh, paperwork done. And there is a, still a, a struggle between the European Union um, and, and, and Germany in that case, but will it change um, a position and will, will the Nord Stream uh, pipeline um, have, have a different uh, outlook in, in German foreign policy towards the Russian Federation uh, where we would probably see a harsher stance? I simply cannot see um, a, a, a constellation that would uh, really uh, lead to this. We could say that the Greens openly uh, oppose Nord Stream and uh, have, have a very high focus on, um, on, on human rights. Uh, they will most likely be part of a government, but they will not lead this government. 
and uh, all the other uh, parties that will be part of that government, be it social democrats, be it liberal uh, party, although they are pressing on the Navalny topic, they are um, not as, as critical towards uh, the Kremlin as you, as you might uh, think. And um, also the CDU is not going to drastically uh, increase the pressure. And Merkel uh, was certainly not a, 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 a big friend of Putin as, as Gerhard Schröder has been. Um, but she, was, she, she could have certainly um, put more pressure uh, on the Kremlin, but I do not see um, a change in, in a reaction uh, here, regardless of, of the outcome of the vote. To finish up, nevertheless, where we might have the most competitive, in a sense, of um, po uh, possibilities of outcomes uh, in the elections on Sunday, the elections for the Duma have been probably the least competitive in the past uh, three decades. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sebastian. That was an interesting and a very interesting answer you gave to other colleagues of ours when, uh, on how, how should we interpret uh, with a sort of a grim smile on our faces what has happened uh, just uh, some days ago. Um, I, I can see that it's a sort of a pervasive uh, atmosphere embedded uh, with pessimism that nothing could come forth. But again, this is the paradoxical uh, meaning of uh, predictability. I mean, it's like when you know that a terminal, um, a, a terminal illness will take you to the grave in the end. The problem is in how much time will this happen? Where will, who will be attending the funeral and where the grave will be? I'm sorry for this. <laughs> I'm sorry for this uh, analogy, but it's only to, you know, to, to put some more pepper <laughs> on our on our discussions. I mean, I'm glad I'm glad you still smile at it. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for your contribution. I would now turn to Ariel, Professor Mo. You've been closely um, watching uh, uh, the debate. Well, actually, the, expo the, 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 the ideas our, our friends participating into this meeting um, have exposed. Uh, what would be, how would you see these elections from the other corner of our continent? What can be seen from Norway? Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I think we are very much in agreement here about this being not real elections. Uh, nevertheless, the question is, what can, can we take some, uh, some takeaways from what has, uh, has happened? Uh, do the results tell us something? Well, uh, there are some, some nuances here uh, about the, the, um, the votes that have been counted, uh, showing that uh, United Russia is not doing as well as maybe the leadership had expected. The communists, or, or sort of semi-opposition, is doing somewhat better. There's also very low turnout. Uh, there was a new party that came in, sort of a manufactured party, but still sort of something new. So all these sort of very general uh, impressions, I mean, there is something here. But I think if it talk about the election, we have to look at it more broadly, and not only the election results, but also how the elections were organized, and the efforts put into manipulating the elections, which I would say was, was quite high. Uh, and we all know that, you know, this starts with the, with the selection of candidates, or keeping unwanted candidates out. We see the, the um, spoilers, spoiler parties, invented to, to detract the votes. And the spoiler candidates in one man uh, uh, precincts to, to confuse voters. I mean, a lot of efforts that were put in here in addition to the general uh, repression. My point here is that this says something about the status of election and about the 
sort of the, 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 the strength of the regime. And uh, my overall uh, conclusion is that this whole process seen uh, together is that uh, United Russia, Guinea Russia is on the decline. And I think that is understood also by, by the political leadership. As you all know, there are opinion polls, you know, which give a more uh, precise probably impression shows, showing that Guinea Russia is, is clearly a minority. Uh, a clear minority uh, support in the country, even if they manage to get constitutional minority, majority. So in Russia, there is no I mean, very few people who, uh, uh, who doubt uh, that Yedina uh, Rasi is a minority party. The question for us here in Norway and also for all of us here in, the, in this group is, of course, what does this mean uh, uh, for policy? Now, of course, in Russia, uh, policies and decisions are not made by the parliament. Uh, it's made by the Kremlin. And uh, therefore, it's interesting to, to discuss to what extent is Yelena is Rancilia sort of equal, as equal uh, Putin in, in terms of uh, population's uh, understanding. I would say that Probably not, not completely. And again, referring to opinion polls, Putin as a president has more support than than Yelena Rasi. It must be said that Navalny from early on always had destroyed the brand of Yelena Rasi, calling it the party of thieves and swindlers, which has stuck. And uh, so Yelena Rasi has been unpopular for a long time. Interestingly, in this year's election process, um, Putin decided to associate himself more closely with the party. He's always been sort of close, but now he was more, uh, uh, more closely associated, which of course is sort of risky. He also placed two of his fairly popular uh, ministers, uh, Lavrov and Shoigu, on top of the Dinarasia list. That was something new. So obviously his own association and these politicians must have to shore up support for Yedin Arasir in the election, which didn't actually help that much. So it is, is, this is a defeat for, for, for Putin also, no doubt about it. So what about policies? Again, policies are not decided by, by parliament. But if I'm right that Yedin Arasir and thus also Putin is weakened, that may have uh, uh, implications for, for policy. And uh, the most serious uh, implication, which was uh, in a way put forward also by Perry here earlier, is, is uh, the question whether we risk sort of um, foreign policy actions to, to shore up uh, support for the regime, which was obviously part of the of what had happened in Ukraine in, in 2014. Very, very popular. And it gave, gave Putin a significant boost, which lasted for some time. Although by now that effect has, has died out, but could it be repeated? That is, I think, uh, the, 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 the big question. I would say that, uh, well, Russia took a big chance, or Putin took a big chance in, in, in 2014. And um, well, there are different opinions. What, did, what was really the reaction? How much did this cost Russia? Uh, I think the re reactions were more long lasting than, um, than uh, Putin had uh, anticipated. Because uh, we must admit that uh, in the West, at least, the uh, memories are very short, and uh, we see that uh, things are forgotten soon and start anew. But the effects of uh, Ukraine 2014, they linger, and they have been costly to Russia. I think that is something that Russia is has to take into account today. Under all these uh, discussions, I think in Russia now, there is also some instability 
not much, but some instability due to the sort of next phase of the Putin presidency. Yes, he has a success in getting uh, presidency for life if he he will, if he wants to, uh, but it's not completely certain that he will. And of course, he is getting older. And in, in such a regime as Russia, any uncertainty about uh, the leadership is sort of being extended into the whole apparatus. So I think that is a factor that we will will will, will see. People are hedging for the future. Even if formally the succession problem got under control by the change in the constitution uh, last year. Just imagine if he hadn't done what he did, fixing the constitution, then this would have been a very big issue in Russia today. But by fixing the constitution in a way he could neutralize it to some extent, but not completely. What about uh, what about the implications in over part of the road in Norway in the north? Well, uh, I think we have uh, we have a quite stable relationship with, with Russia, but we have had elections in Norway too. In fact, uh, just a little more than a week ago, and it's maybe more interesting to discuss whether these elections will have any uh, impact on their policy towards Russia. I think in Russia there are expectations in that direction. The sitting government has been very vocal, quite sharp in its criticism of, of Russia. Whereas the, uh, the new prime minister, Jonas Kastori, who was uh, foreign minister uh, eight years ago, is seen as a more diplomatic uh, person and may be more open to, to finding a common ground with Russia in some areas. I think, though, that uh, these Russian expectations are exaggerated, and I don't expect very much real changes, but maybe some changes uh, in, 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 in the language. The main problems in the Russian Norwegian relationship are caused by Norway's uh, close relationship with the United States, which seems to be getting even closer. And uh, which, again, has to do with the sort of weakening of the guarantees from NATO, which have been sort of been uh, replaced by stronger direct ties to the US, including the just recent agreement of, uh, of, of stationing of, uh, of US uh, troops, not bases, but uh, stationing of US troops on Norwegian bases, uh, which is, of course, is strongly protested by Russia. And that will remain sort of a, 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 a a point of criticism from, from Russia in the, in the years uh, to come. Otherwise, uh, Russia and Norway has a quite good functioning uh, cooperation in some important areas, notably uh, environment, search and rescue, and not least fisheries in the north. That's, that's working quite well, and uh, which has very big benefits to both sides. So that is a state that these are stabilizing uh, factors. Okay, I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Ariel. That was a most brilliant analysis of what uh, what has happened in, in, in Russia lately. And ago, um, I think that we are all heading towards the same uh, the same cardinal point. Um, we should brace ourselves ourselves for worse. It it looks like. And I will turn now to Professor Radu Karp, who has um, joined us recently and ask him whether there could be any comparisons in the very nature of the political regime in Russia and other political regimes um, that would pretend themselves to be democratic. How would you, how would you consider, would you consider such a comparison first? We cannot, we cannot hear you. I think that you have to unmute yourselves first. Professor? Yes, now you can hear me. Yes. The main conclusion it's, uh, from, from these elections is that uh, the West shall not forget what is going on in Russia, inside Russia, because the West is focused more on the international agenda of the regime and less on what is going on inside the regime. And not many people knows 
what are the mechanisms behind this kind of elections? If we see the reflection in the media, except some important uh, online uh, sources and, and newspapers, we see that everyone agrees that there were not free elections, but not many analysts could explain why these elections were frauded. And this is why it is very important to explain the mechanism uh, that uh, is inside the, the democracy uh, in Russia. First of all, it was a Romanian political scientist, Matei Dogan, who offered a very good insight on what democracy could, uh, how, how democracy could be perverted. He launched the term mimic democracy in, this, in, the, uh, in order to, to describe political regimes that are mimetic towards democracy. They borrow the mechanisms of democracy. They include that in the constitution, they assure free elections and even complicate mechanisms for uh, ensuring the will of the people under brackets. But in fact, they are not democracies, they are authoritarian regimes. And from the moment when Matei Dogan launched this, uh, uh, this concept, a lot of political scientists studied uh, mimic democracies around the world. Mimic democracies uh, are in two hypotheses. First of all, there are authoritarian regimes that at some point wants to be perceived as democracies. And therefore, they open uh, democracy. They organize elections. But in fact, these elections, in these elections, citizens have no choice. The second path towards what we call mimic democracy is that an authoritarian uh, state is born out of a fallen democracy, of a weak democracy. And in order to unveil this uh, nature, they adopt the mechanisms of democracy. So this is the case of Russia. So after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we witnessed um, a, a new state that want to find its way, we want to be perceived as a federal state, as a democracy, as a working democracy with elections and so on. But since the arrival into power of Mr. Putin, we see that uh, he's trying to cover with a veil what is going on exactly in Russia. And it's very interesting that the mechanisms of democracy were expanded while they were not applied. But it's, this is the key to understand these elections. Why? For example, just take the uh, electronic voting. Electron in not many countries have uh, experienced with good results electronic voting, e-voting. A lot of countries introduced pilot projects. And here, Professor Ali Mo could tell us about the example of Norway, who tried to do it step by step by um, uh, uh, making, uh, making a, uh, some pilot projects and then to see what is the result and so on. But in Russia, what we've seen with this election, uh, for the first time, the highly controversial uh, electronic voting was introduced in 2019 Moscow City Duma election. So in a way, even the practice of organizing a pilot project was fulfilled. And in 2021, uh, the Central uh, uh, Election Commission from uh, Russian Federation has announced that at least six electronic elections, both federal and municipal, would be held in regions, including 
Moscow. Even initially considered convenient for casting vote after the election, the e-voting has met with severe criticism, but it is interesting inside Russia, because not, as I said, not many people from outside understand how the mechanisms of electronic voters are perverted. They seem to coincide 100%. But in reality, it's uh, 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 e-voting, it's used in order to fraud votes. Uh, suppression of opposition candidates. Uh, here is where the regime cannot uh, uh, practice the strategy of uh, uh, whale to, 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 to cover what happened. Here, Mr. Putin ha had to be brutal in order to suppress the opposition, uh, the opposition uh, candidates. But even in this case, opposition candidates were barred on the pretext of a relationship with the anti-corruption foundation, which the government banned as an extremist organization. So everyone could be suspected of being a member. Everyone could be suspected of being an extremist. Um, some uh, opposition leaders were imprisoned without explanation. And this is, I, I think, the weakest point of these elections. The Russian regime cannot explain uh, why the candidates were barred from participating. And, uh, uh, and um, uh, Mr. Navalny, it's not the same. Um, the, target, the opposition candidates were targeted by intimidation techniques. Uh, we know in political science this strategy, doppelganger candidates, a person of similar look and surname is put on the, sa on the, on the same ballot in order to confuse voters. Interestingly, the first time we had in history this example, was in uh, St. Petersburg local elections in the beginning of the 90s. So we should ask ourselves, what happened if after 30 years, the regime uh, used the same technique as it was in the early 90s? Because in the manuals of, of, uh, of, uh, of political uh, campaigning, it is said, don't do like this, because uh, if you don't have the control, the total control of the vote, the voters will be confused and you will not achieve the result. It will deepen the confusion and that's it. But in the case of Russia, it works quite well. Why? Because the authoritarian state control the vote. I give an, an example what happened in Bulgaria. In Bulgaria, at some point in the elections of the European Parliament, there was a confusion. Two candidates with the same name, and people voted. One running from the uh, from the uh, from the uh, party of uh, Mr. Borisov, and another one from a very small party. And the second one won more votes, and even he succeeded to be elected in the Parliament. And then he refused the mandate because it's always a confusion. But in the case of Bulgaria, which is well, uh, we can we can talk a, a lot about the practices of of, uh, of uh, Gerb at that time and uh, afterwards. But in the case of Bulgaria, the state didn't control the confusion. They even don't realize that this confusion exists. But the practice of introducing doppelganger candidates, it's strictly forbidden in democracies. It's strictly forbidden by practice. There is, you cannot uh, ban someone to run in an election, of course. But you, in, uh, in the political process, you can say that this practice is forbidden. 
And uh, the last thing that I want to, to refer in order to, to see um, uh, why, why the, the elections in, 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 in Russia were folded with a lot of techniques that are not um, uh, analyzed is uh, it's the electoral system. Basically, Russia, it's a federal state with the electoral system that is practiced in Germany. Basically, Russia could be the same as in Germany, which shows that if you have people in power who use these undemocratic mechanisms, you can pervert even a German type parliamentary democracy. Uh, you know that there were some uh, discussions about changing the electoral system in Russia, but it gave the impression that these discussions were, uh, how to say, uh, democratic. In reality, the regime could be favored by both systems, by the current system, because there is no opposition, and by all other changes. So you see, uh, there is uh, in, in the mirror, we see the reflection of some uh, basic mechanisms that proved to be useful in other democracies. But in Russia, the uh, analysis is more complicated by the fact that it's a very advanced system of cheating voters. It's not like I don't know, in a dictatorship, uh, uh, in a forgotten dictatorship in Latin America, where all of a sudden someone uh, presents himself as the, as the uh, son of the, I don't know, uh, of the country, of the, uh, as, uh, as the uh, supreme leader and so on. It's a very sophisticated case of manipulating the basic mechanisms of democracy. And this thing, uh, I, 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 I think, should be underlined in, uh, in, in uh, analysis of, of these elections, because I think it's more important than to analyze the results of the election itself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Karp. Thank you very much. I, I, saw, I saw Professor Kemper frowning onto some of your words. So I will turn to Professor Kemper for his comments and, um, and uh, uh, interesting analysis. I have nevertheless one question for you, Misha, before you, you kick on. Uh, what would be, what could be the relations between Islamic minorities living in Southern and Central Asia, Central Asian uh, parts of, uh, of the Russian Federation with Moscow after these elections is still the memory of what was happening in the late 90s, living in Dagestan, for example. Misha, please. Uh, thank you very much. Now, I would like to make a few comments on what has been said before in the first place. Yeah. Um, my argument would be that Russia is weak. We're talking about a country, the biggest country in the world, with a population of this almost the same size as Japan. And Russia is weak. And just from all the statements that we heard, the, the system, the political system is weak. And this is why I disagreed with the comparison with Germany, because it's a presidential democracy where the Duma has nothing to say at all in the first place, where the government is completely dependent on the president which means these elections are not just fake in the way how they were carried out, but they were also deeply undemocratic from the constitutional aspect of the Russian Federation. Second, you have the Adlamandatnoyim, which means the seats that come from the regions, and this is, I think, what, um, what Kar Baradu had in mind, which means the winner takes it all in the regions, and this is the mechanism to make sure that Yedina Rossiya wins. Yeah? So each of these regions sends Yedina Rossiya delegates in addition to the directly elected party seats, which means although the party has less than 50%, it can still have the absolute majority in the parliament. Uh, at the same time, the weakness of Yedina Rossiya is very clear. In one of his largest speeches or texts, Putin called the Communist Party of the Soviet Union the safety valve that kept the Soviet Union together. 
And I wonder whether Yedinaya Rasiya is such a safety valve because the Communist Party of the Soviet Union had a very clear structure and organization and you knew with whom you were talking. Yedinaya Rasiya is a big bunch of businessmen and of, yeah, of people with no color at all. You have to be in Yedinaya Rasiya if you want to make success in life. So it's worthless. And that, of course, means that democracy is worthless in Russia. At the same time, it's a symptom of Russia's weakness. Uh, if we look with a bird's eye, then Russia is a nuisance to Europe and the West and not a threat. From a bird's eye, we would see it's a country that is completely dependent on fossil fuels from which we want to depart. It's depending on an income that is declining. Not now, not this year, but over the next 10, 20 years, a pipeline like North Stream 2 will make no difference because we will not need the gas anymore. The military of Russia is very strong in destroying, but it has been used so far very, to, very, very, very cleverly, very sophisticated. For instance, in Syria, with a minimum effort, reach most, uh, most uh, success by supporting the local troops. Russia is not good at, the, at this moment in, in carrying out warfare. I don't think that the Russians would ever dream about attacking Lithuania or Estonia or whatever, simply because they would hit German, Italian, French, or British uh, or Spanish airplanes that are patrolling there. And it would immediately bring Russia into a war with these countries. Russia has no reason to do that. Russia is at this point, the leadership of Russia is a gerontocracy like in the 1970s. We're talking about the Brezhnevs and the Andropovs. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned Lavrov, who is one of the career diplomat, one of the stability poles of the regime. But at the same time, who will come after him? Not just Putin's succession is a question, but also the other guys in the system. Um, the young people are leaving, and the young people are leaving physically, and they are also leaving mentally. The country is in disarray. Young people wouldn't know why to go to the to the booth and, and vote for whom. All these, all these political parties are fake. If you look at the other parties, right? Um, one of you mentioned the Zuganov who said, basically I'm the same as Putin, just a communist. Um, the other parties are set up by oligarchs. And of course they have no other color than this oligarch, which means there must be something else. There must be something different coming uh, when this generation is going. There is no follow up to Putin. Uh, yeah, what does it mean for us? I would say relax. Oh, and uh, Ukraine, of course, the, the taking of Crimea was a strike that came as a surprise for the Ukraine, but Ukraine was in complete disarray and we were not prepared to do that. And the Russians were already there. They didn't need to bring in troops because the troops were already there. The Donbass was handled miserably by Russia. It, it's a nuisance to Russia. Uh, and they still do not know what to do with it, which is also a big bummer for, for Putin because he, he doesn't decide to occupy it and to swallow it, although the Donbass leadership would have liked to do it. So Putin is weak all over the place and can only be and keep himself and his Yelena Rasia party in power by this fraudulent elections, by this, by this degradation of democracy. And at the same time, he lives in a dream world. Uh, Elections bring legitimacy. If you construct fraudulent elections of this scale, you do not receive the feedback from the population and you lose legitimacy in the eyes of your own people. Which means it's on the one hand, the peak of Putin's power because he eliminated all contenders. But at the same time, it's also the end of the story. It can't, the, the next step would be Pinochet. Uh, how should we act? I think the most important problems of this era is not Putin, is um, a sustainable energy in order to get out of the climate crisis. For this, and I see the glaciers in, in Ariel's background, we need to cooperate with Russia, but we need to cooperate where we can. Uh, and you mentioned fisheries and, 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 and safe and rescue operations in the Arctic uh, as an important point where we share interests. Russia's interest is, of course, building the uh, Northern Sea Route in order to redirect the trade from China and make it a Russian route. And then should, we should be very careful. There are alternative routes and we shouldn't destroy the Arctic for the sake 
of, uh, of, of giving Russia another possibility to control world trade. My daughter is at the window and I cannot open the door because I'm talking to you here. <laughs> uh, with other words, I would say, let's relax. Let's not talk about the uh, alarmist military scenarios and see where the real problems are that the next generation will look at when they ask, what have the people talking about Russia in 2021 really had in mind? Thank you very much. Thank you. But anyway, Misha, thank you very much for what you say, but you haven't answered my question. Oh yeah. Muslims in Russia, um, I have friends in Russia and they say, of course I go to the street to demonstrate for Putin. The question for Muslim is what comes after Putin? If that's a Russian nationalist, then it's much worse for Russia's minorities. Russia's system as it is, is the lesser evil for Muslims in Russia, whether that's Chechnya, 99% for, uh, for Ramzan Kadyrov, or Dagestan, or the Muslims in Tatarstan, because Putin so far keeps the federal system intact. Uh, if we have another leader of Russia, say a military leader, Pinochet, right? He might say, Navalny, he might say, we change Russia into a unitary state, we abolish this old fashioned, um, these, these reservoirs, these reservations of the Tatars, Bashkirs, Yakuts, and you name them of all these small minorities and create a unitary Russian state, this is Russia. This would be a worse outcome for the Muslims. They would lose their cultural autonomies and they would find themselves in a huge minority situation. So Muslims in Russia tend to be very conservative and <laughs> tend to be also uh, able to link up to Russian conservative circles, including Orthodox and monarchist circles because they, they share family values or at least they say they share family values. And that is the kind of the defense shield, the kind of the wall, the, the, the wall that uh, Russia has been building up to defend itself from uh, infiltration by democratic ideas from the West or radical extremist ideas from wherever in the world, from, from the Muslim uh, extremism in the South. It is a consensus on anti-liberalism. Anti-liberalism is the consensus that keeps Muslims and Orthodox people united in the front against the intrusion of those LGBT supporters from Amsterdam, like myself. Thank you so much, Misha. That's been extremely interesting. Please stay with us for the next moment. Uh, Professor Heinen, Armin, I'm, 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 you have been carefully and diligently listened to everybody. And I know that you have one of the most synthetic minds I ever came across. And this is not because you're a historian, but you have a, a huge, in a, in a huge measure, a degree of understanding the world and its sensitivities. Uh, what would be the relation between history and this regime of today in Russia? Uh, this is actually uh, the question I've put myself and prepared a little paper to stick to the time. So I will refer to my paper. But it's just on the direction you, you mentioned. Let me start with a look at the coverage on the election in Russia by the German press. What is striking reading, reading German newspapers and looking at TV is the little attention paid to the stomach. Sure, we do have our own elections and there are real elections with an uncertain outcome. But behind the fact of little press coverage regarding the election in Russia, there's also a lot of incomprehension and resignation in regard to everything what is happening in Russia today. For the German press, it is quite clear, latest with the condemnation of Alexander Novalny, who was poisoned by the Russian secret police and was cured in Germany, that Russia has gone all the way of a guided democracy to its open dictatorship in the last years. In this respect, the reports on the elections in Russia by the German press are full of sarcasm. The very interest lies in on how the elections were faked. Details of interest, not an analysis of the Russian political system. Thus, what is missing in my perception, and Professor Karp just talked about this, is the question why there are elections in dictatorships. For a more concrete answer, we must have a look on the consequences of the elections for Russia itself, 
but also what these elections do mean for the European Union and for Germany. Let's start with analyzing the functions elections fulfill in dictatorships. First of all, we have to distinguish between modern dictatorship and authoritarian regimes. Authoritarian regimes, such as the royal dictatorship in Romania in 1938, rely on demobilizing the population and they base their rule on forms of traditional legitimacy, incorporating old party politicians or other representatives of the former regime. Modern dictatorships rely on the legitimation by the people as there are no other resources of legitimation, neither charismatic, traditional, or rational legitimation. That is why they depend on plebiscites, elections, mass rallies, etc. Even under Hitler, there were elections and plebiscites. And modern dictatorships, to sum up, are dictatorships of produced consent because they have no other forms of legitimacy. We'll have to come to this later on. Elections, to continue with my argument, are driving the dictatorship into a gray fog of ambiguity. Actually, they deny to be simple dictatorships. Elections legitimize privileges of the ruling class. And for the secret police, they are a good test on the popularity of the region. Let's look with this in mind at the concrete situation in Russia itself. Perhaps it is not wrong to use the ideas of Max Weber, the German sociologue, to describe the development of the regime in four stages. At the beginning, we have a charismatic justification of Putin's rule. Putin as the savior of all evils of transition. The second phase would then be that which could be described as a transition from charismatic to a rational bureaucratic form of rule. The third phase would be that of a crisis regarding the degenerated model of rational bureaucratic legitimation. At this point, we see a turn to a decidedly nationalist policy, which, however, is quite difficult for Russia to stick to, as it is obviously at the same time striving to become again an empire. However, empire, this would mean acceptance of heterogeneity. The fourth phase is that of an open crisis of a corrupt regime, which does not have any longer nationalistic outcomes at low price, a situation in which Russia finds itself at this moment. In concrete terms, this means that Putin is more dependent than before on the loyalty and the fear of the regime profiteers. All of them are afraid of losing their privileged position, while the mass of the population is told that the alternative to dictatorship will be chaos. The irrationality, the irrationality of action by the regime in this situation is increasing up to open manipulation of elections. Anyone interested into it would be able to prove the case. But manipulating elections openly in the public gives also a lesson to the opponents of the regime. It demonstrates the strength and the willingness of the regime to defend its position. In future, the regime is constrained to expand to its repressive policy, and at the same time, it most probably will try to win approval through foreign policy successes and even imperialist advances. For the EU, the situation in Russia on the one side means simplification of things. On the other side, we see an aggravation of the political situation for the European Union. Russia's turn towards open dictatorship means a simplification insofar as there is a convergence of perceptions within Europe. France, like Germany, has long relied on Russia as an intelligent player in the international system. Now it has become quite clear that dealing with Russia means dealing with an open dictatorship and thus with an international player difficult to have trust in. 
The position of the European Union has become even more difficult because Europe sees itself largely isolated, isolated in today's international relations. The US continues its policy of focusing on Asia. Russian is, as I have explained, returning to open dictatorship. China is, and plus, China is squeezing Europe economically as well as the US, and Russia has largely dropped out as an economic partner. In Germany at this point, I will come back to my observations at the beginning of my commentary, all hopes, all illusions are destroyed that Russia will be an interesting partner of Germany. Germans in the past, after 1989, actually had hoped that it could promote democracy in this country, or at least rule of law, and at the same time profit economically by close trade connections. The next German government, whatever constellation it will reflect, will not want to break off ties with Russia, but it will pursue a very sober policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia geared to its own interests. Attempts will be made to emphasize cultural exchange even more than it has been so the case so far. In some respects, the disillusionment may also make the government's policy easier, at least regarding the German public. The German friends of Russia hardly will have any resonance in the public, and financial investment into the military will find more acceptance than the years before. In short, and to sum up, the Russian elections have led to disillusionments on all sides. This may turn out to be the beginning of a realistic approach by the EU and Germany towards Russia. At the same time, the Russian regime will continue to lose stability and thus become an even more difficult player in the international system. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. Thank you very much. It was, uh, well, that was the, the, the tinge of optimism I could discern <laughs> from your words, but I, I've, saw, I, I, I've seen Misha saying, trying to say something. Please, Misha, briefly. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Professor Heinen. I agree with you mostly. Uh, I would not say that Russia is isolated in the world. Russia has wonderful relations with other dictatorships in the okay. world or with authoritarian <laughs> regimes, and there are many of them. Yeah. Russia is very, very uh, successful in developing its own foreign policy in the Mediterranean, in yeah. South and Latin America, yeah. and in Asia, of course. Yeah. But but uh, there is the problem you mentioned that they do not have actually the financial background to play really a role in the world. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have the means, they don't have the ethical means. This is basically what you said. They don't yeah. have an attractive social model. Yeah. Right? It's not, there is not the soft power of the US after no. the Second World War that would attract opinions of the world. And we all focus on copying the US. But Russia is very skillful in adopting its foreign policy to individual target countries. So yeah. Saudi Arabia and Iran, hey, both countries are partners of Russia. Yeah. Yeah? So how do they do that? By blinding out ideology, and, yes. no, and Russia is blank in terms of, yeah. of ideology, and thereby doing business. And this yes. means it will be very difficult to expect that Russia would economically go down, even if we no. enforce our sanctions. Of course not. No, no. no. Uh, but but uh, with Turkey, uh, they do have real problems because they do not have the, the money, the uh, means to fulfill the Turkish expectations. I th so th 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 there's a, a restricted room of uh, handling things. Well, Sebastian, you were going to say something or I saw you trying to... <laughs> <laughs> I, I would... I, I will have to leave like in 10 minutes, um, which is very sad because I, I love all the things and I love that the optimism uh, is coming into the discussion. And I, 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 I really don't want to spoil this. Um, I don't foresee a, a military uh, scenario um, as well, um, because NATO is uh, strong enough to deter Russia and Russia is weak. Yes, but um, as you have already um, also said, what comes after Putin? So waiting out this, uh, waiting out this regime, is not is not going to solve anything. And in the in the optimistic timeline, okay, maybe that works. 
But in the realistic timeline, I see that if we wait this out, it will have a further uh, domino effect on countries in Central and Eastern Europe uh, because they will follow the, the Putin model. And even the, 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 um, the, the optimism that uh, NATO is protecting um, any Russian aggression um, is, is somewhat flawed because let's wait what will happen in the US in, 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 in a year and then in, in three years. Um, and then the security pillar in NATO might just turn into a fascist regime that um, is no longer serving our, our interests here. There are ways to, to counter that, but I would not be I would not be optimistic in waiting in waiting out the the, the Putin regime. I completely agree that we have bigger problems than the Russian Federation and climate change is the biggest problem. But at the same time, we can't wait that out either. Hey, Sebastian, thank you very much. Uh, this brings me to the words of, uh, of one famous um, um, uh, political scientist regarding, um, regarding structural realism and the theoretical basic of structural realism. Uh, I mean, his only criticism to the famous theory was that we have an, uh, uh, we, we, we think idealistically that individuals and countries there to foreign regimes uh, are um, uh, rational actors. Well, not always. <laughs> so you don't know what, what, what should come, what should come out, what, what ought come out of the box. I will turn now to Professor Diaconescu, who is ready to deliver us um, some of his impressions about the way the um, um, uh, vote, the, the voting process was organized um, by Russia in Transnistria and in Donbas without the agreement of the local authorities in Chisinau and Kiev, um, as well as uh, in Crimea. Um, and this would be the way of introducing our younger colleagues, uh, Dr. Al Bulescu, will... Um, delve more into um, Donbass and Crimea's uh, electoral processes. Then Mr. Costa, um, uh, picking up from what um, Armin just said about Turkey, and let's see what he will say about uh, Turkey-Russian relations today and what should, be, uh, what should we uh, expect from. And uh, um, uh, last but not least, Dr. Mustetsa about um, uh, what was the subject of elections presented in the uh, Russian press? How multicolored or how blunt and, um, and gray looking were they um, presented theretofore? Um, Professor Diaconescu, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Murianu. Uh, first of all, I want to tell that, uh, generally speaking, this election in Russia is a joke. The winners were close before the election process. But this election is an important tool for assessing Russian perception and its place in Transnistria, Donbass, and Luhansk. Why? Russia organized the, uh, the election in uh, the separatist regions from Republic of Moldova and Ukraine without the approval of the governments from Kishinev and Kiev. I want to give you a small detail which show us the methods of Russia. For Moscow, Moldova is just a part of the former Soviet Union or former Russian Empire without respect of the international rules. At least for Moldova, Moldova, I know from direct sources that in July, the Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs sent a letter to Chisinau to inform about their intention to open 30 polling stations in Moldova, 27 in Transnistria and three in Chisinau, Boltz and Comrade, the main cities under the authority of government. Kishina officials ask for the list and addresses, but just on 15th of September, Moscow sent this list with two days before the election started. The government did not give its approval for Transnistria officially because it cannot assure 
the, the security in this uh, separatist region. Instead of this, 27 polling stations were opened in Transnistria. This, I think, is a clear signal that Moscow, though not recognize, does not recognize the sovereignty of the Republic of Moldova. And uh, the declaration made by Dmitry Kozak several weeks ago during his official travel in Chisinau, uh, Transnistria is an internal problem of Moldova and Russia does not interfere in it, was just a challenge, a false subject for the newspapers. Nothing changed in the Russian policy in separatist regions and frozen conflicts managed by Moscow. On the other hand, I want to draw your attention that uh, there were more participants in the election process for Russia, around uh, 56,000 in Transnistria, than that for the Moldovan parliament in July, were around uh, 29 or 30,000. This means double from quantitative point of view. Please do not forget the suspicions of corrupting voters in July for the Kishino parliament. This means the people from Transnistria are more interested in Russian politics than that in Moldova. The big number of voters show us the loyalty of the people from these regions uh, towards Russia in general and the loyalty to Putin especially. The simple comparison of the voters' number say us again how difficult could be to find a political solution for the frozen conflicts. But I want to invite our colleague, Dr. Ana Maria Albolescu, to tell us more about uh, the election process in uh, the separatist region and to tell us how many voters in Transnistria had voted with Putin's party. Please, Ana. Anna? Uh, it's still on mute. Her micro is on mute. Oh, okay. sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yeah. I think it's fine. Yes, Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for a very interesting discussion and um, not just refer to some of the statistics of the results of these elections, though I think they are important. Um, but I'd like to to make a point about uh, why the why the legitimization strategies of Russia um, are still important in terms of whether we've had a discussion, for example, are we waiting for Putin to have a, you know to to try another military action? Um, were we very surprised by what happened in Crimea, and can can this happen? And um, so, if looking at simply are the strategies that um, that Russia has had, uh, not just since 2014, but since 2008, for example, um, in Transnistria, by comparison with uh, with what has happened in, uh, in Crimea and the Donbas um, throughout these elections, uh, what, what I'm interested in is to see whether, for example, is there anything new? And I think one of the, one of the main, main points that I would like to make is that Yes, the, um, the, the novelty and the ingen ingeniosity um, of the regime um, is, um, is exactly the fact that it is mimicking uh, a democratic strategy, but um, you know, it, it, it doesn't achieve the same aims as, um, as, um, as a democratic government. Um, and if I, if I may also refer to, um, to the fact that if we look at um, a difference between the results um, um, across the, the separatist regions, um, you know, it, it, there is a difference in terms of um, the reactions. If you look at the reactions of the central governments, um, there is a weaker reaction in in, uh, in Moldova, for example, and then in the, there is in Ukraine. And, um, you know, that, that can be explained by the fact that perhaps Crimea is more important. Uh, you know, Crimea has been uh, legitimized by the fact that now it has... Uh, it has deputies in the in the Duma, whereas in in Moldova and um, in the Donbas, uh, we are still debating. You know, we, we don't know. Uh, we, we are not united as a as a European continent, um, and every member state has its own positions. So I think that in terms of, of what these results mean, um, you know, I'm more tempted to to say that we can't we can't judge at this point whether. Um, 
whether we will see another military attack. Um, but we can safely say that there is continuity between the strategies that have been used in terms of legitimizing these elections, but there's also these changes in terms of the technological means that we use to, um, that Russia is using, sorry, uh, to, um, you know, to react to, to the European Union. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Albuquerque. Oh, yo, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry. No, sorry, I said thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Abulescu. Thank you very much. And I'll turn to Dr. Costa uh, with a quite a direct question that I would like to address him. Was there any diplomatic conflict between Ankara and Moscow over the way elections were organized in Crimea? Uh, thank you for, very much for your question. Um, Turkish state-owned media did not publish information regarding the allegations of election fraud made by the Russian opposition and uh, several NGOs against the Russian government. Um, they published only uh, the final results of the vote, but um, they, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs made uh, some uh, statements uh, regarding the Russian parliamentary elections held in Crimea. On uh, 20th uh, September, Tanju Bilgic, the spokesperson of the Turkish Foreign Ministry, stated that from Turkey's point of view, the parliamentary elections organized by the Russian Federation in Crimea have no legal validity. Uh, soon after, Russia reacted to uh, Dmitry Peskov, Kremlin uh, spokesperson, who underlined that Moscow did not accept Turkey's position because it was not correct and uh, was ready to clarify things with the Turkish side. Uh, a day after this statement, uh, day after Turkey's statement, Maria Zaharova, uh, Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson stated that Turkey is well aware of the fact that Crimea is a sovereign part of Russia and uh, it is well aware that Russia uh, never ignores uh, such uh, statements. Uh, she also added that Russia will draw the appropriate conclusions which uh, def uh, definitely do not benefit bilateral ties. This exchange of remarks took place just two weeks before the meeting between Erdogan and Putin, scheduled for 29th of September in Sochi. Uh, the main agenda point of the meeting is Syria, namely Idlib, uh, but also the recent development, regional developments and bilateral relations will be discussed. Uh, one week ago, Putin met with Bashar al-Assad in Moscow, and during the press conference, uh, he criticized foreign forces uh, that are in Syria without uh, uh, permission or a UN mandate, referring to Turkey and the United States. Uh, therefore, it remains to be seen uh, to what extent the subject of the Crimean elections will be or not on the agenda during the meeting between Putin and Erdogan, scheduled for the next week in Sochi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Costa. And I now turn to Dr. Mustaza about uh, who's been invited to, to give us a sort of a, an idea about how elections were reflected in local media. You've already posted uh, your article on our website of the center. So, Yulia, you have the floor. Thank you. Firstly, please let me thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, it has been truly a pleasure to be listening to, um, to the ideas shared by you all today. Uh, now, if you allow me to share just a couple of observations on how the um, uh, Russian authorities and um, the Russian media have exposed the electoral process uh, before, during, and right after the, the election days. Uh, well, it can be observed how there is an interest in uh, presenting the unfolding of the elections um, under the form of chronicles, timelines, infographics. Um, but it needs to be said that there is little space and attention given to uh, critically analyzing in the mainstream media um, the tendencies, the preferences of, of the voters. Uh, well, one explanation, one explanation might be that there is a lack of significant surprises in the overall results. Um, however, after perusing what has been uh, exposed in the public sphere during this time, uh, two dichotomous topics could be observed. 
as they have surfaced during, during this period. Uh, the first one being the pair of external um, interference versus Russian authorities' uh, interference in the electoral uh, process. And the second, uh, transparency and legality of the elections versus frauds and uh, violations. Uh, following on the um, first element of the first dichotomous pair, uh, naming the claim that there have been uh, external, more, more specifically Western interferences in, in the Russian elections, uh, there are a series of reactions um, uh, in the public sphere. Uh, one, for example, comes uh, from an official that has been um, uh, very outspoken on, on the topic. Um, and this is Maria Zaharova, the spokesperson of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who, uh, for example, targeted directly the American and German embassies in Moscow for creating a scheme uh, where they employ Russian citizens who use the money they are paid as salaries. Uh, and I will give you a direct quote from an intervention she had on the 6th of September transfer funds to the appropriate structure, structures, naming Alexei Navalny's projects. Uh, Zaharova went on to announce on uh, the 11th of September a confirmation of the US interference in the Russian elections, uh, stating that there were quote unquote concrete facts which proved how the US authorities through internet platforms owned by American companies tried to influence the Russian elections. Um, the subject was dropped uh, by uh, the spokesperson on the day before the start of the elections uh, when she announced that the American uh, relevant authorities um, had been uh, provided with uh, clear data uh, indicating to American interference in the elections. Uh, her conclusion was that, quote, uh, Washington cannot get rid of this with just uh, statements. End of the quote. Uh, in contrast, the dichotomous counterpart of this point uh, comes from journalists and publications that aimed uh, at showing and proving how, in fact, it was the Russian authorities which intervened uh, with the elections, uh, both before and during the, uh, their unfolding. Um, I'll give you the example of Kirill Martinov. Um, uh, he's the editor of the politics department of uh, Novaya Gazeta. Uh, he published an article in the second day of the um, elections in, on the 18th of September in which he announced, uh, quote unquote, the Chinese scenario started through the installation of a sovereign runet. Um, the editor presented uh, how on the night of the 16th of September, so the day, uh, two days before he published the article, um, a large Russian internet provider started to block Google Docs. We all know what this platform is all about. Um, he said the purpose was to block Navalny's uh, supporters from disseminating uh, information. Uh, Martinov continued uh, with describing the measure as an act of intimidation. That's a direct quote from his article, uh, but also hinted at the gro um, uh, growing capabilities of Roskomnadzor, um, uh, of uh, uh, quote unquote, deep traffic filtering, therefore of blocking Russians access to modern apps. Um, ta tackling the first element of the second dichotomous pair, which is transparency and legality of the elections, um, Ella Pantlova's comments, the chairperson of the Russian Electoral Commission should be mentioned. Uh, she called the whole electoral system, quote unquote, unpre of unprecedented openness and transparency, uh, right after the voting uh, stations were closed. Dmitry Peskov also has some comments on, on the matter. Uh, he's President Putin's spokesperson. Uh, he followed the same line in expressing the, positive, the president's positive assessment of the elections for the state of Duma in terms of, quote unquote, competition, openness, and honesty. Um, plus, there were multiple publications that followed the same line. Uh, some focused on uh, the unveiling, uh, on unveiling the safe nature of the electoral process in the current epidemiological situation, praising how the rules were strictly observed and how there were just a few incidents that were resolved firmly and immediately. Um, Gazeta, for example, uh, in an article published right after the, the uh, right before, with a few minutes before the closure of the polling stations, uh, focused mainly on the online voting system and its impact and significance in the electoral process, uh, praising the system as being, quote unquote, convenient, fast, and safe. Uh, in contrast, uh, other media representatives citing independent observers contradicted the officials in stating that there had been, quote unquote, serious staffing and falsifications. 
uh, there are reports of uh, falsifications and some serious incidents, uh, as I mentioned. Um, here we can uh, we can mention Stanislav Andrychuk. Uh, he's the co-chairman of Golas, uh, which was recently labeled as a foreign agent by the Russian Ministry of Justice. Uh, so he was uh, cited uh, with stating that there had been uh, quote unquote night developed stuffing and other irregularities. Uh, plus, Andrei Chuk brought forward the significantly increased number of those that opted to vote at home, uh, considering the practice, quote unquote, abnormal, and the convenient scheme to leave the site and toss ballots into the ballot box. Um, here again, we can bring uh, forward Kirill Martinov. Um, uh, he had a, a specialized edition of his uh, uh, online um, um, uh, show uh, called Ujaznia Novosti, Terrible News. Um, there he pointed out numerous uh, reports of violations and intimidations uh, coming from uh, different uh, Russian regions. Uh, he especially highlighted the ones coming from St. Petersburg. Uh, in response, uh, St. Petersburg governor said that the elections ran smoothly in um, the culture capital of Russia. Uh, it can be noticed how there seem to be two different uh, stories of the same reality. Of course, it is up for debate which one of the conversions or maybe another one is closer to reality. Um, as a closing point, I would kindly invite you to read the article I have written on the topic on our Romanian Center for Russian Studies website, where the points are presented in more detail uh, that I managed to do in just a few minutes today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mustetza. Now that we are closing, uh, almost we're very, very close to the uh, uh, to the end of our uh, of our meeting. I would uh, like to do a sort of a tour de table with uh, one minute allotted to uh, all participants, except our youngest, who have been uh, sharing with us the experience of this public uh, presentation. Um, and I will gladly start with Professor Karp. So, conclusions? Well, as I said, the conclusion is that uh, we have to focus more on the, what, what is going on in Russia from the internal point of view. Uh, as I said, the international agenda, it's a, it's a priority, but uh, for, for Western countries and for uh, analysts, but uh, in the same time, what is going on inside the system is very worrying. And as I said, the mechanisms were uh, sophisticated uh, 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 in the sense that it's not very easy to counteract what is going on. You have the propaganda that it's uh, uh, between between the, the reality and uh, the, 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 the fake uh, reality that is presented in the media uh, in, in Russia. And, uh, but you also have the sophistication of uh, electoral mechanisms designed to pervert democracy. So I think that we should focus more uh, to write in order to write more in order to make more comments, in order to advertise more these kind of uh, meetings. Uh, um, even if they are online, they can capture a wide audience. And, uh, and I think that uh, that would benefit uh, for all, not uh, only for the ones that are interested by, by Russia. Thank you very much, Professor Karp. I now turn to uh, Professor Mo Arild. Yes. What could be put, what could be said in a nutshell about our meeting? What would be the conclusion in one minute? I think there is very much agreement uh, on uh, the elections. But the big, big question is, is Russia weak or strong? It has been, uh, been uh, alluded to. And it can be both, I think, at the same time. In some sense, they are strong. And in many senses, they are weak. Personally, I think uh, the regime is, is, is getting weaker, but still is, is strong. Uh, I think we need to look also at the economic underpinning of Russian power and the regime and how that develops. And certainly that's close to my sphere of interest uh, to determine what are what is the sort of the options and the possibilities for political action by the regime. So that's my sort of suggestion for further uh, research. When it comes to military matters, 
I think we have had a very good uh, discussion about the sort of the, the limitations of, of Russia's uh, military strength in Europe, whereas uh, Russia has been a successful diplomatic actor in other parts uh, of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ariel. Uh, Professor Heinen. Uh, yeah, you have to unmute yourself. No, we cannot hear you. We, we, you have to unmute. Yeah, I had to put on my yeah. microphone. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's almost all the same headlines. There's quite an agreement on the main topics. Uh, frauded elections, weak dictatorship, a new situation for the EU and Germany and Norway. Without that, uh, there will be a disruption of the relations uh, towards Russia. And we further have to reckon with hybrid forms of war. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Armin. Uh, I turn now to Professor Goshu. Conclusion in one minute. Uh, even uh, after this fake election, um, with the results, uh, with false results, Russia remains. Uh, an authoritarian electoral regime. Russia is not a dictatorship. Um, and um, election is uh, still very important for uh, the legitimization of the Putin's regime. And uh, I guess the evolution of the uh, uh, Putin's regime depends also uh, on the other events, for example, how uh, Lukashenko regime uh, runs in Belarus and uh, depends on the result of the election in Germany, uh, France, uh, depends on the rhetoric of Washington, uh, Brussels uh, towards uh, Russia. Uh, I'm more pessimistic now than a few weeks ago with uh, these uh, results, uh, but um, uh, we should keep in mind that uh, uh, Russia is not only Putin. Uh, we uh, have to deal with uh, Russia uh, even after Putin. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Goshu Armand. Um, Professor Kemper, Misha, conclusions in one minute. There is one person here who hasn't said anything yet, Mihai. Who is that? Sorry? Is you? Yeah, yes, I'll be the last. I'll be the last to say. <laughs> okay. In a nutshell, Russia has lost. Russia even has, has lost the post-Soviet space. Uh, Ukraine, Moldova, I would say. So it's a kind of defensive position that Russia is building up at the price of its own democracy. It's a very tragic situation where... The fear of war, of being attacked by the West, is being used in order to repress all dissent in the country. Thank you very much, Misha. Uh, Professor Diaconescu. Yeah, I think uh, the democracy in Russia is just our dream of an analyst out of Russia. Uh, until uh, in uh, Russian college, in Russian universities, or in Russian schools, uh, the courses about democracy will be nothing will change in Russia. But for us, democracy in Europe is a reality, and we want to, to be same in Russia. But the Russian people does not understand what means democracy. And I think all our analyses have to, to, to keep in mind uh, this this reality of Russian mentality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Diakonesco. Well, I myself, I found, I found this meeting of ours, um, uh, of which I should be um, um, uh, very happy, um, extremely interesting and most welcome. Most welcome not, not only to the Romanian public, but also to the international public. We had quite an audience on, uh, on our website and I look forward to seeing much, many more other people joining us when um, the record will be posted on um, Facebook and YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. 
thus making um, our efforts uh, being together and then analyzing what happened in Russia um, far more social and, and in a way uh, public. It, there is a public thirst, you know, uh, in, in, uh, that could be well um, uh, acknowledged, uh, 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 directed towards seeking predictability of something that looks looks continental, but it's not continental. And uh, quoting the words of a famous historian, uh, Orlando Fidges, who wrote, as you well know, quite um, uh, a lot about um, Russia's modern history. Uh, he says uh, in one of his books that 1917 was the point when Russia lost her credibility. And we are still seeking for it, sometimes trying to lit up our ways of understanding the situation. Um, seeking predict predictability through means of analysis um, is absolutely logical and in a way falls into our, uh, into our uh, Greek Latin tradition uh, of uh, epistemological research. On the other hand, how far is Russia from us? Is Russia a different animal from the zoology we already know? Is Russia so unpredictable? That was basically what the answers of tonight's meeting uh, uh, try to, 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 to extract to the, to the public. The truth is that, and this might be one of the reasons why some uh, that, that we are not smiling enough in this very moment, although I, we should be quite happy about, your, about ourselves and about the knowledge that we, uh, we have amassed about this, please, Misha, uh, is that uh, we know that there is no definitive answer and that the plasticity of this situation is so dynamic that it could change at any moment. And therefore we sometimes shy away from the predictability itself. And I come now to the words of Professor Mo, which I would I would suppose that could be shared by everybody around the table. Uh, we, when, when, when analyzing the Russian phenomenon, we should not be one-sided or one-sighted. There are so many other per, per, uh, uh, perimeters that have to be called into discussion from economy to culture, from uh, the, social, the new social fabric of, 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 uh, of uh, the nation itself, to um, what the gerontocracy in Kremlin uh, 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 would look like, that what a blunt analysis of about a couple of hours, which is quite a lot, uh, would not um, succeed to archaeologize too much. But on the other hand, these kind of meetings um, have their meaning in educating more about more about what the environment of our world, what uh, sometimes the neighbors of ours to the EU or to NATO um, could look like. And what was one of the most, uh, I would say, um, um, uh, one of the best um, outcomes of our meeting is that we have spoken freely. Well, about when addressing the Russian phenomenon. Well, unfortunately, it does not happen east of our borders. And this is, this is certainly a conclusion we could all agree upon. Thank you very much for your presence and for attending this meeting of ours. It's been a delight. And I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the, 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 the moderation chair. Uh, and thank you very much for, um, helping the project uh, grow forth. And I look forward to having you again as uh, our guests for future, in future podcasts we will organize. Um, uh, please feel free to be ours because you have all our, we have need, we are in deep need of, of voices like uh, uh, those that have been gathered tonight uh, with us. Thank you very much. I wish you uh, a, uh, good and lovely evening. And to those who have followed us, um, please um, become friends of our Russian, Romanian Center for Russian Studies. It's absolutely worthwhile. Thank you very much, Arild, Armand, Radu, Misha, Armin, Marius, Yulia, Anna Maria, 
and Catalin and all the others who have been with us. Thank you very much. Have a nice, have a nice evening. All the best to you.